I am very, very excited to be here, very excited to be back. Uh, my wife and I and our two kids were visiting in California for most of the summer, um, seeing family and friends, and um, that was a, a great ministry, great opportunity to um, minister to them, and, and some of our family and, and friends aren't walking with the Lord, and so uh, Jewel and I were uh, fully aware of what, what we were walking back into, and we had some great opportunities to um, talk with them. We had a lot of great opportunities to hang out with our nieces and nephews and, um, and just share with them the love of Christ. And so very, a very phenomenal, fruitful time. Um, but I got to admit, about halfway through, um, I was just desperate to be home. <laughs> um, I missed you guys. I missed uh, this family. I missed this church. Um, it's, it's something that, this church is something that I, I just can never stop um, talking about, to never stop bragging about as far as uh, the love and, and the, the activity of the Spirit here. And so I'm very, very excited uh, to be home. Um, today, <clears throat> today, I'm very excited. We are kicking off a new series. So we're going to be going through uh, the book of First Timothy um, and perhaps maybe uh, Second Timothy after that if we have time. Um, I'm very excited about that. Um, the book of First and Second Timothy, as well as Titus, make up the pastoral epistles. Um, and I've al- they've always resonated with me um, personally. Ever since I became a Christian, um, I've been, you know, looking to, uh, to looking to God to understand more about what it really means to uh, be an active follower of Christ, not just somebody sitting on the sidelines saying, praise Jesus in the church and then going home and living my own life, but a, a real active Christian life where there's more in, uh, involvement on a daily, moment by moment basis uh, being responsive to God's will in our lives. And ever since that, that sort of conversion took place, um, reading through these, these books was a phenomenal experience because um, it's written to younger, younger pastors. Paul is writing to Timothy here, uh, a young, young pastor, um, and he's telling him, don't let anyone despise you for your youth. Be uh, set an example that is uh, worthy to be followed. And I look at that and say, that's what I want for my life. I don't want to be uh, I want to be an example. I want to be someone who follows Christ um, wholeheartedly and isn't deterred by uh, the fact that, um, that I'm a young child, uh, which is still true. I am a, a voice-cracking young child. <laughs> uh, that'll probably be true for the rest of my life, that voice-crack thing. I don't know. I just can never get away from that. Anyways, um, so if you guys want to open up your Bibles to First Timothy, uh, I would love for you guys to read along with me in this, um, in this first chapter um, I kind of want to set the tone or, or the, uh, the setting a little bit more, though, um, before we uh, dive in. So Paul is the author of First Timothy. He's writing, uh, he's addressing a letter to uh, his friend Timothy, a uh, co-worker. Timothy has been on uh, missionary journeys with Paul in the past. He's learned underneath him, spent several years with him. Um, this, is, this letter is taking place right before Paul's second arrest, the one that will uh, lead to his um, execution, um, his martyrdom. And so it's happening about maybe 30, roughly 30 years or so after uh, Christ has left, uh, after he ascended. And so there, there's this expansion of the early church that takes place during that time. Um, it was a, a rapid expansion with, um, with a lot of great fruit. Um, all over the, the area, there are churches being planted, largely due in part to uh, the spreading after the day of Pentecost, after all the believers went out, out, out of Jerusalem after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. Um, they're, just, they're spreading out the word. Paul is doing missionary journeys. So is Timothy and Silas and Barnabas. And it's phenomenal to see all of these, um, this rapid growth taking place. And now we're seeing kind of um, towards the end of the, the documentation that we have in the New Testament about the early church, um, we see Paul giving some instructions to Timothy. He left Timothy in Ephesus, uh, in the city there. He left him to uh, govern the church and, and gave him some specific instructions on in how to deal with some of the problems that were facing the church at the time. And um, he expected to come back uh, right away, uh, be able to visit again, and, and he left a letter in, in lieu of that. He's saying, I, I want to come back and visit. Here's some more instructions about this um, to tide you over until I come. Um, so we're really excited to see what he has here. The application that we find in First Timothy um, is incredibly applicable to us today. Um, it's very appropriate to understand um, exactly what, was, um, what Ephesus was struggling with, what Timothy was up against, um, because those things are the same things that we are, are facing today as well. Um, he, he writes in First Timothy to um, address two primary issues throughout the book of 
throughout the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, the first one is to address the false teachers that are cropping up, that are surrounding uh, the city and, and permeating the church. And the other one is to oppose the false teachers with um, the example of a life that is shaped uh, entirely by the gospel. And throughout 1 Timothy, he goes back and forth talking about false doctrine um, and the life of uh, a life shaped by the gospel in the elders and the leadership, a life shaped by the gospel in our prayer and how we interact um, in fellowship, a uh, life that is shaped by the gospel in our personal lives. And he goes back and forth and he, um, he's sharing with Timothy exactly what it means to be uh, a God-fearing, Christ-following Christian. And so I love that. It's very, very exciting um, to, to see that and see the application. Um, and so before we jump into the Word, let's, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. Lord, thank you that you are sovereign and supreme. Thank you that you love us so much. I just love that song we were singing, Lord, how you love us. It's amazing to, to know that that love is beyond even our scope of understanding. So Lord, I thank you for that. I praise your name. I pray that you would help us to uh, fully understand what your word is, is teaching us today, that you would help, it to, uh, help us to apply it to our lives and, and recognize the dangers of, of false teachings, um, even in today's society. And, and um, rather than, than focus on that or, or be distracted by that, that we would live a life that is shaped by the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you guys have your Bibles open, 1 Timothy chapter 1, I want to encourage you guys, um, if ever I am up here or anybody is up here, don't ever take... Uh, take our word for what the Bible says. Please bring your Bibles, open them up, read along with us. Um, I, I promise that I will in, um, not speak heresy uh, intentionally. Um, but we, let's go ahead and read here. So we're reading in chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. So right away, Paul sets up uh, the, the opposition of the false teachers and we see the charge, the stewardship of God, the charge that we are to, um, to push forward uh, in love. And we, we're going to take a look at that. Um, I, I really like the way that Paul always opens up his letters. He's always uh, very um, official, stamping his, his name on things and, um, and stating what, what his exact purpose is. He's, uh, he's sharing his, um, the authenticity of his, uh, of his power, of his authority. We have the declaration of, auth of authority right away. Um, Paul is the author, and he's saying that he has been sent by God. Um, he is an apostle of God. An apostle is somebody who is sent, right? So we have uh, the, the 12 primary apostles, the 12 disciples, the, the capital A's. And then we have apostles that are all throughout uh, the rest of church history. We are all apostles. We have been sent by God. We join in that um, apostleship. Um, we see that Jesus is the prime apostle. Jesus is the prime apostle. He was the first one sent by God the Father down to um, uh, to really proclaim a, a new means or the only way to uh, receive salvation, the only way to have a, a meaningful relationship with God. Uh, Jesus was the first to be able to come and do that in a, in a full and, and exclusive way. And ever since Jesus, we have been um, duplicating that process. He had the 12 disciples with him. He trained them up. He brought them alongside. He sent them out. Uh, these 12 disciples, after Jesus was gone, did the exact same thing. They trained up other people. Paul was a byproduct of that, and, and uh, through Paul, Tim, Timothy was a byproduct of that, and through Timothy all the way down through the generations, Bob is a byproduct of that, and I'm a byproduct of Bob's teaching and, and discipleship. I remember sitting in a Discipleship 101 class back in 2008 and just learning exactly what it means to be a God-fearing Christian that's, that's more and more, more active than, um, than just coming to church, and, and that's exactly what the Bible commands all of us to do. 
And now I'm, I have the, uh, the wonderful privilege to be continuing that process. We are all um, apostles sent out. This is um, also greatly referencing the, um, the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, when Christ is telling the disciples exactly to do this, he's saying, go and make disciples. He's saying, make this a reciprocal process. Um, and I love that. He's recognizing right here as well in, in verse one that he is commanded by God. And I think that that's one of the most important aspects of uh, an apostle, the apostle Paul's work, as well as all of our work. We are commanded by God to bring this message. We are commanded by God to interact with uh, these people in such a way, these people that are, are doing false teachings. He's commanding Paul's commanding Timothy to do so uh, on his authority set down by God. And so we see that in this verse 1 and 2 with the, um, the authoritativeness of Paul speaking with Timothy and giving him instruction in how to interact. Um, and, and he moves right along straight away into the, um, the primary issues here. In verses 3, in verses three he sets out uh, the problem that is facing the church in Ephesus. He says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that, so that's, this is what he's been told to do, so that, and the primary purpose is that he can charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrines in order to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. So there are people that are devoting themselves to different doctrine as well as myths and genealogies. And I want to explore a little bit exactly what's taking place uh, what these men are devoting to themselves, who these men um, are, and the effects of uh, this, this false teachings. Because I think a lot of us in today's uh, Christian society want to just kind of keep our heads down about some of the issues that are out there right now. Um, we, we're fully aware of what's going on in America with um, things like homosexuality and, and the, um, uh, the pervasiveness of like Planned Parenthood and the educational um, sector. And and all of that is really devastating, but there's a whole other aspect of danger posed to the church and that is spreading. And, um, and I think a vast majority of people who claim to be Christians or are calling themselves Christians have no idea that they're being deceived by false teachers. And I think about just these, um, these churches across America, churches that are supporting things like, maybe you guys have uh, re recognized the term health and wealth or like the prosperity gospel um, or like the seeker-friendly movement, things like this where... Um, where they have this massive following and people are, are saying that they're praising the name of God and yet there is just an absence of something, something that is key and a, a crucial component. Ultimately what's taking place is that there's, um, there's this false doctrine taking place and we don't, we don't want to be blind to that. We don't ever want to um, ignore that. And uh, so when we're, so Timothy is, is up against the same issues here. <clears throat> uh, there, are, there are three different um, types of false, or two particular types of false teachings that uh, Paul is addressing right now. There are many more out there, but right here we're looking at two specifically. The first one is different doctrine. Different doctrine is the first, uh, first form of false teaching that's taking place. Doctrine are, is a set of beliefs, right? Um, so w regarding Christianity, we have a, a lot of different doctrines. We have... Um, uh, doctrines on the Trinity, doctrines on the attributes of God, doctrines on the salvation uh, through Christ alone, uh, the doctrine of sin. These are all the different beliefs that we have uh, about these different topics. And all of these different beliefs are governed um, and laid out by what we see in the Bible and nothing more. We only have the Bible as the source of, uh, the, the true source of information regarding what, uh, what our set of beliefs are supposed to be. Um, and so we see that there is different doctrine being teached here. Um, the, the biggest one, obviously, is salvation by Christ alone. Especially in this time frame, what is happening is that the, the primary religion, <clears throat> uh, at least as it relates to the Jewish uh, culture, is Judaism, right? Um, which is based entirely on the Old Testament um, and, and not on anything, uh, anything else. Uh, the Old Testament proposes that, that uh, we are... Uh, to uh, work for the Lord. We are, are to have uh, you know, animal sacrifices to atone for our sin. Um, and we need to keep doing that because the animal sacrifices are only temporary and cannot fully satisfy <clears throat> the, the penalty for our sins that we commit on a daily, moment-by-moment uh, -moment basis even. And so what is taking place here is there is this, this mixture of, 
of teachings of, of a salvation by works and a salvation through Christ, or perhaps even a replacement there. Um, and that is not at all appropriate. We see that exactly in verse 7. So if you guys jump down with the, me a little bit. Um, these people are desiring to be teachers of the law without any understanding of what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. And it, uh, being a teacher of a law um, isn't necessarily a, uh, a bad thing to teach law. But what Paul is saying here specifically, this is the same verbiage and language used um, to talk about um, uh, rabbinical exegetists, which is the, uh, the Jewish priests who are teachers of the law. But what the teachers of the law stand for specifically is not just how to keep the law, but that the law is what saves, that trusting in the law and fulfilling the law is what saves us. And that is not at all appropriate. It is a very different doctrine to that of salvation through Christ alone. So we see different doctrine <clears throat> permeating, but the old, different doctrine doesn't necessarily mean that there is a something that is completely separate or replacing Christ. Um, we see this, unfortunately, in, in a lot more subtle ways, too, um, because what I don't see in Christian churches all over the place is people saying that, you know, Christ was, Christ was just a man. You don't see that in Christian churches. There's a lot of other religions that are saying that. Um, Mormonism and, and uh, Jehovah's Witness will say stuff like that. The uh, but within Christian communities, you aren't going to see people denying the, the, um, uh, the godship of Christ. What you're going to see is that Christ came to save everybody, but not call them to repentance. Or you're going to see things like Christ came to love us, and we're supposed to live a life of grace, which is totally a biblical concept, but it doesn't have anything or it lacks the understanding or the, the information about how we are supposed to live a life that is uh, permeated by grace and thus transformed by grace. And we just want to live in grace and that allows us to keep doing what we want to do and not be transformed and, um, and experience the holiness that we are called to. And, and that is, um, it's dangerous, very, very dangerous. And uh, in fact, I, um, I was visiting friends and family back home and, and I visited a church um, while we were there and, and this church was talking about um, had some really good concepts that they were talking about and, and people were praising the Lord and, and, and the worship was, um, was really energetic and exciting. And, um, and when in the middle of the message, they were talking about just all of the different, um, the ownerships and the relationships and the different ships of, um, it was a, a Father's Day message and um, all the different ships of a relationship with God, you know, and, and um, it was fun and it was themed, but there was something that was missing. And, and I kind of, came to a realization about it uh, partway through the message when they were talking about ownership in particular. And I was thinking of all the times that ownership appears in the Bible and, and how uh, the, the ownership that we have is, um, is in Christ, how we are adopted into his family. We are now sons and daughters. And so the ownership that we have is an inheritance in heaven. And, and the things that, the, that this person was talking about, this preacher was talking about, was all material ownership and how God prophesies into our life that we'll, we'll have wealth and that God will prophesy into our life and, and preach uh, to us that we are to um, experience um, life abundantly here and that is the end game. And God does want us to have abundant life, but that's not talking about material possessions. That's talking about an abundant relationship with him that gives us joy and peace no matter what the circumstances. And that abundant life was totally being perverted in what was being talked there. And I gotta admit, I just broke down crying. It was sitting there right there in the middle of the service. And I'm getting teary about it right now because um, it's sad that there are so many people that are listening to that. They're not searching the word, they're not looking into the Bible and they are totally being deceived. And it's sad, it's really devastating to my heart. But that different doctrine is so dangerous, and we need to be aware of it. And the other, the other type of uh, false teaching that's taking place in Ephesus um, is the myths and genealogies. And um, <laughs> growing up reading this, especially as a kid, I, I had no idea like what, what Paul was talking about. And in fact, I thought Paul was a little bit crazy because I thought, man, myths, I love myths. I love fantasy books and things about dragons. And I love, you know, reading about the Loch Ness Monster. And I was always afraid to go into the woods and get eaten by Sasquatch. And yeah, yeah, it's a, it's my, it's a real fear. Um, <clears throat> he exists, guys. He exists. That one's not a myth. 
No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I, I thought about myths, and, and is that what Paul is talking about? And I thought about genealogies, and I'm like, well, that's pretty hypocritical. You know, there's genealogies even in Matthew talking about the lineage of Christ, and there's genealogies all throughout the Old Testament. And, and I'm like, these are important. We know where Christ comes from, and we can see exactly how God is a God of order and has um, ordained, you know, uh, Christ's parentage and lineage all the way from the dawn of creation all the way over to uh, to Adam and Eve, and, I th- and, and that's not what they're talking about here. Um, these myths and genealogies is the same verbiage used in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and Titus chapter 1. Um, in those sections, they're also talking about false teachings, and those ones explain a little bit further what they're talking about. They're talking about um, deceptive and contrary to the truth um, uh, concepts, concepts and, um, and speculations that are additives to uh, the true source. Um, one of the prime examples we have of this is the Book of Jubilees, which is a, a, a Jewish literature book written um, in the early church times. And this book was, uh, uh, gives an, a, an expanded history of Genesis and Exodus. Um, it, it talks about everything from creation all the way up through when Moses uh, was re- received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Um, but it goes into much more detail about all of this stuff. It talks about the creation of angels, uh, talks about the uh, much more detail, the Nephilim and how uh, fallen angels mated with, uh, with women and, and that whole race and the history of that race. It talks about um, just a lot more different people that, uh, that were leaders there and, and their, their sins and faults. Um, and the, the problem with this is that um, it is not God-breathed. We do not know the, the accuracy of such things. And I mean, um, uh, much of what they talk about in this book and others are potentially biblical concepts or could be true, uh, but are in no way God-breathed and specifically authoritative um, as the word of God. And these kinds of things were things that people were devoting themselves to. They had access to these books and these resources, and they were saying, well, these things are good, you know, really good information about, you know, what Moses was doing and why Moses did these different things. And what Paul is telling Timothy is saying, don't you dare listen to that, because that will taint your understanding of what is true, what is completely accurate about who God is and about what uh, the history of his people are. We no longer have any of the original manuscripts um, of, the, um, of the book of Jubilee, which means that it is also incredibly open to transformation as the time has gone. Who knows what the original documentation said or what's been added or even removed um, from, from those accounts. And so when he's talking about myths and genealogies here, he's talking about speculation into, the, into, um, into who, who God is through, uh, through means other than the Bible. When we take our understanding of Christ and we take our understanding of God the Father and the Spirit um, and the, the examples of men we have in the Bible, um, we only utilize the information that is within the Bible. Uh, we can expand with that by uh, looking deeper into um, when different uh, wording is used in other parts of the Bible to help better understand it. Um, But we don't compare those sources to something else and say, oh, well, because this person wrote this, this is what the Bible means. And that's exactly what happened with Joseph Smith. I mean, he had this secondary revelation, you know, in the Book of Mormon, that he had this secondary revelation from God, uh, supposedly, and and says, you know, now all of a sudden, this also is, is considered a holy text, and, and it changes things. It legitimately changes things, and so in no way are, are, are Christianity and, and Mormonism um, anywhere worshiping the same gods. And it's important that, that Paul is telling him to address this, because um, I, I used to really enjoy this kind of thing, and even I was even um, doing some research about Timothy as a man, and they, they have books. They have books out there about Timothy. You know, they have um, um, tons, supposedly tons of other letters from Paul, tons of other letters from, you know, uh, from the apostles and, and communication in the early church. Um, but the reality is we have no idea whether or not any of those are true. We have a lot of, um, we have a lot of documentation that, that, that could potentially support that. Other ones that say it's, it's not true, but if it's not God-breathed, if it's not within the Bible, we cannot take it as 100% accurate. And even as I was doing research on Timothy, some of the information that I was reading um, is now kind of logged in my mind alongside what I know from uh, passages in the Bible. And I even had to backpedal as I was studying for this section, saying, oh my gosh, I'm doing the exact thing, same thing that that this passage is telling uh, us not to do. And so I was like, all right, let's just step back from that, set all of that information aside. And, and so um, 
uh, I'm hoping that I haven't mentioned anything that, that isn't uh, in the Bible, and I need to make sure that that's entirely um, the case for all of, of what we do. It's really important um, that when we are looking at um, commentaries of the Bible today, that, uh, that we're not listening to any commentaries or any people that are saying anything that's not directly sourced within the Bible. If they're saying, this is my interpretation of it, and they don't give any reason why or any, any biblical source or, or, um, or credence to that, don't listen to it. Um, it's really important that we use the, the scriptures as the sole foundation for who, how we understand God and who he is. And that's exactly what Paul is telling Timothy here. So he, there's these two different types of false teaching that are taking place um, in emphasis right now. And Paul outlines some of the effects of these teachings as well. And that's the next section. We have the different forms of false teaching. And now we're looking at the effects of these false teachings. Right here in this chapter, um, we see just a few of them. Um, in verse 3 specifically, uh, he tells them that, there are, that they're teaching different doctrines. So the first effect is really obvious. There's something different from uh, the gospel of Christ, the gospel that Christ alone saves. Um, in verse six, we see the second one. Uh, there is a swerving from God-honoring effects. In verse six, it says certain persons, by swerving from these, and these are talked about in verse five, we'll look at that in just a second. By swerving from these, they have wandered away into vain discussions. Um, and that's the next one. They, they are in vain discussions. The effects of these teachings, the effects of uh, of this uh, heresy in, in the church are swerving from God honoring effects and vain discussions. And when we talk about vain discussions, it's not like self-centered discussions. We're talking about the meaninglessness, the purposelessness of those discussions. Um, and I, I, um, I've had several conversations with people in the past where I'm totally guilty of this. I just want to, you know, um, I just want to talk about, you know, eschatology or, or the end times and, and be like, well, what about this? What about that? And, and sometimes those are good because there's a furthering uh, of our understanding of what the Bible talks about. But then eventually, or potentially, it, it drifts into the realm of speculation where you're just discussing the possibilities or, or thinking about this as, a, as a, uh, something that would, be, that would be great and not having it based upon um, scriptures. And ultimately, there's no fruit coming from that. Um, there's no... There's no um, advancement of the gospel through vain discussions. And it brings to mind Colossians 3, verse 23. Uh, Whatever you do, work at it with your heart as working for the Lord. And our intention with this verse and this command is to be intentional with everything that we're doing. There should be purpose behind every action, every conversation, um, every thought that, that enters into our mind. And so we need to uh, pursue not vain discussions, um, but meaningful interactions. Um, the other, the next effect, the last effect that we see here in, um, in this section is found in verse 7. It's lacking understanding. Um, these guys are lacking understanding. Uh, we see in verse 7 it says that they are desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. And I, I think about just all of the different people out there that know what the Bible says and yet put their own desires ahead of them um, in their teachings. I think about guys that are, that are teaching along, alongside the prosperity gospel and, and perhaps at one point they really were, really were God-fearing and really were seeking to teach the, the true message of Christ, but then fame and wealth came into the picture and in order to maintain that, they... They sacrifice the truth of the message. They sacrifice the, the message of repentance. They sacrifice the necessity for holiness and rather preach a message that is all-inclusive, that brings people in, that, that wants to love people, and, and that's all. And there's, there are huge mega, mega churches out there that are, that are teaching this and, and are lacking understanding about what is really truthful. And... Um, and that's a bummer. The, we see later on in 1 Timothy, um, Paul goes on to talk more about these effects. In 1 Timothy 4, um, he talks about these guys having departed from the faith. They have no faith in Christ. Um, and they are devoted to the teachings of demons. And I mean, like such a, a radical departure. They are devoted to the, the teachings of demons. And even later in, in um, chapter 5, he talks about how they're straying after Satan and persisting in sin. These lives are marked by... Uh, by discernible differences in their direction and, and where their allegiances lie. And that is, um, it's, a scary, it's a scary thing to think about. 
And um, these effects are, are significant in such a way that we need to understand the full ramifications of what is happening um, in America today with these false teachings that are taking place. Um, the, the understanding that it's not just something that we can ignore or something that can be on the sidelines is something that we need to really take to heart. Because if we just say, all right, well, our church is teaching, you know, sound doctrine, and so I'm, I'm safe here. If that is the end of our interactions, then what we're essentially allowing to happen is we're saying to the people that are claiming to be our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're saying to them, I don't care what happens to your soul. I don't care what happens to you moments from now when death knocks at our door and then we're going to be separated from Christ for eternity. Um, that, that kind of calloused heart cannot be uh, and should not be uh, uh, something that, that is spoken of us as Christians. In fact, we have the direct opposite of that commanded to us um, in verses 4 and 5. Um, and this is where I want to look at the stewardship from God. Um, this is the third section I really want to uh, take a peek at, the, the stewardship of God. Stewardship is the work or the administration. Um, it is the charge of God, right? Um, some of your Bibles say uh, in, in verse 4, uh, the work of God or God's work. Um, so let's read in verse 4. So these guys, he's saying, telling them not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations. Rather, and this is where the switch is, rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience, conscience and a sincere faith. And so the, I love how our God is always a God of order. Um, everywhere you look in the Bible, if ever there's something that they're saying, don't do this, don't do that, there's always a do this, do that. God doesn't just leave us hanging dry and saying, hey, you know, these are all the do's or don'ts you shouldn't do. And, um, and so long as you don't do those things, you're going to be fine because um, that doesn't solve any problems in our life. That's true for addicts. Um, you don't tell an addict, hey, stop doing this or stop participating in this. You say, rather, do this instead. Participate in this and, um, and move in this direction. Replace it with something else. Um, an entirely biblical concept, even just by uh, the nature of how the Bible is laid out. And we see that here as well. Paul is telling Timothy, don't abide, the, uh, don't abide this activity. Charge these men not to teach in this way. Uh, rather, teach them to do this. And this is what your charge is. And so he says that the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So that first one, a pure heart. Our charge to spread love is made up of these three, three concepts. They're... Um, there are so many different ways that you could categorize the, the charge of love. But when we are commanded uh, to love, we are commanded to love God and love others. And, and as we uh, fulfill that, we do it through these three ways. One through a, a pure heart, um, which is opposed to sinful desires. Um, this is uh, in direct correlation with the effects of the, um, the, effects of the false teachings. Um, there's in verse 6, it said that they are swerving from God-honoring effects. If you are swerving from these God-honoring effects, you have the opposite. You are no longer within that path. You are now on the opposite path. Um, and so what the effects are in that uh, sense is that they have sinful desires, a life following um, these, these false teachings and, and motivated by these false teachings as sinful desires. And we're supposed to have a pure heart. Matthew 5, 8 says, um, when Jesus is uh, giving the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying that blessed are the pure heart. He's saying that there is a life that is blessed and that is appreciated and is God-honoring when we have a pure heart. And the purification of the heart is the ministry of the Spirit. God, sent, God the Father sent the Spirit into our lives so that we can be purified, so that we can be constantly molded into the image of God. We see this in John chapter 15, uh, that the Spirit is here to conform us into the image of Christ. We see that through the illustration of, the, um, um, of the, the vine and the branch and how there's a constant pruning. Um, they're, they're, we're whittling away the things in us that are not of God and are uh, constantly being molded into the, ima uh, the image of Christ. There is a pure heart that is a necessary component of our love for one another um, and towards God. If we don't have that, if we have sinful desires within our life, if we are, are ruled by that, then we are not able and capable of expressing this love towards others in God. 
And the second, the second component of this, um, this stewardship from God is a good conscience, um, which as opposed to the effects uh, that we see plaguing these false teachers, which is a guilt-ridden conscience. You are uh, guilt-ridden constantly. I think about all of the, uh, the people that I know, friends and family even, um, that are living a life of sin. And when I talk with them, they're just so devastated by, by uh, shame and, and the buildup of, of guilt in their lives. And appropriately so that there's guilt in their lives because that's what sin produces, um, a, a guilt. And, and, um, and when we are in a relationship with, with God, he marks us as clean, removes that guilt, uh, removes that penalty from us. We are no longer guilty. We are now marked clean and innocent, um, spotless. And I love that concept because when we talk about having um, a good conscience, when we talk about having a good conscience, we're talking about our moral compass, right? And that is the spirit within us. The spirit provides this moral compass for us to understand what is right and wrong. When I do something wrong, my conscience uh, ticks, you know, and it says, hey, whoa, don't be doing that. Or I know it, and it's, it's so easy to repress that and just, you know, set that on the side. But we're not supposed to be doing that. And we even see in 1 Timothy 4, 2, later on, Paul continues his conversation about these false teachers. And in uh, chapter 4, verses 2, he's talking about how these false teachers have a seared conscience. They have a seared conscience. These are people who are incapable of making good decisions. When you talk about something that's seared, it's burnt. It's, it's, um, it, it's no longer healthy. It's not capable of operating functionally. Um, it's seared. It's broken. And when we see that, I always thought, like, well, what does that mean? Is there, is there really some sort of, um, some sort of point in, in, uh, in our mental state where we are not capable of making the right decision? And absolutely, I just look at, I look at the, um, the people that are not walking with Christ right now, and I've, I've talked with family and friends, and, and some of them have come so close to turning their life over to God, and, and they're, they're just incapable of walking away from that. They're incapable of even recognizing the truth. And even over the summer, I had conversations with family members, and I was talking about, um, we were just talking about life circumstances. You know, my friends have girlfriends and they're living with them and I'm talking with them about that. And they're just talking about this as if it's healthy, as if it's like appropriate and not only appropriate, but it's, it's good for their relationship that they're living this life in sin. And I'm thinking to myself, how can you even think that? In my mind, it's so obvious, not necessarily that, you know, that I would never do that, but it's so obvious that that's a wrong decision and that that is detrimental to the relationship. If you want your relationship to succeed, don't move in together. That is a surefire way to see it fail because a relationship needs to be built on a foundation of uh, a love for Christ. If you don't have a love for Christ and the other person doesn't have a love for Christ and the relationship isn't built on that, ultimately there's failure. And these people, these false teachers, are, have a seared conscience, a conscience that is incapable of making the right decision. And so the, the opposite of that, um, a, a mandatory component of our spreading life is a good conscience, a conscience that recognizes wrong in our lives and, and the lives around us. And then the last foundation uh, of, um, of spreading the love of Christ, the stewardship from God, our charge, um, is a sincere faith a sincere faith um, rather, rather than the pretense and hypocrisy that is presented by these false teachers. I think about just these guys that are teaching across the nation and, and especially things like the prosperity gospel. Um, I, I wonder how much of what they're saying, do they know as they're saying it, I'm going to hell for this. You know, they think to themselves, you know, it's like, oh gosh, I you know, this is obviously false. I know my Bible, I've studied it, and yet I'm saying it anyways because I just, I need this. You know, I need this attention, I need the fame, I need the wealth associated with it. Um, there, there is a, um, a pretense and a hypocrisy. We see this straight away in, in the Bible with, um, with the, uh, the chiefs and the, uh, the high priests and uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, all, all of the, the group that made up the high council of, the, um, of Judaism, right? All of these people were, were the most pious. They're the ones who knew the law best. They knew the commands of God uh, the best. And they, they tithed the most publicly. They prayed the longest and the most eloquently. Oh, holy God, you know, in front of everybody. And, and this, this mentality, this, um, this hypocrisy, Christ saw straight through it. 
and told them, told them that, that there's no place in heaven for you. There's no place for your falsehood, for, for your um, hypocrisy and your pretense. And our faith that is sincere is the foundation of our salvation. Because Ephesians 2.8, I love this verse, for grace you have been saved through faith. We have a faith in Christ that what he did for us on the cross took place and we accept that and there is the, uh, salvation through this faith. And a sincere faith as a foundation for love, we cannot express the love of God if we do not have a saving faith in Christ. Um, it's phenomenal that the faith in Christ is the foundation of the salvation, that there's no, um, there's no working around the fact that this is a crucial component of spreading love. And there are so many people that are you know, philanthropic in the world right now that are giving millions and, and doing good things and, and, um, and being good people. We would say, oh, these people are you know, morally upright and they're, they're good, but they don't have this relationship with God. And ultimately, all of those effects, if it doesn't point to God, is eternally pointless. If the good works you do don't point towards Christ at, the exact, at, the, at that time, you know, if, they're not, if, if, uh, if I'm handing money to a homeless person and, and I'm just giving out you know, money and there's no connection to the love of Christ taking place, um, that doesn't have any internal ramifications. Maybe the guy goes away a little bit more fed or he you know, thinks, oh, that's another good person, but there's no eternal ramification um, to that uh, expression of love. And so a sincere faith, uh, an understanding of, of a relationship with God is essential for being able to spread the love of God. And uh, as I was, uh, we were talking last night, there was um, a little bit less people and so we kind of had like a group discussion um, it, was very, it was very fun. Uh, I really enjoyed being able to talk with um, the people there. And we were talking about um, just some of the different effects uh, of that and, and our charge. And, and one of the things that we were talking about was how um, our, our allowing these people to continue to preach these things, our, our silence um, is essentially a, uh, um, a sin of omission. There is an, an allowance of this taking place we are essentially giving a stamp of approval by not speaking out against this. And my intention isn't to just, just ostracize people or say, hey, you know, you're, you're vile and wicked and we don't want, you know, we don't want to know you or, or you, know, you just get out. What we're looking for is repentance. We're looking for hearts restored to God. And this is the aim of every interaction that we have with anybody is, is always to have and maintain a restored heart or a, a righteous heart before the Lord. Any confrontation that we interact with between believers and unbelievers, the intention is to have hearts restored to Christ, to have relationships um, that are prioritized above the frivolous things of this world. So many times arguments take place about things that have no eternal ramifications. And all of those things, if there is a damaging of a relationship because of that, man, what a waste of an opportunity. What a, what a misallocation of the responsibility that we have. And so it's really important that we do not follow or abide the false teachings that are taking place um, in society. If people are talking about these and saying, I attend this or I really enjoyed this, say something about it and say, well, it is definitively lacking a crucial component to salvation. It's lacking a crucial component. Repentance is huge. And yet so many people don't want to hear the message of repentance because um, it comes to a rebel heart. The message of repentance to an unbeliever is a devastating and painful message. And yet ultimately, in, in the end, it has the most fruit and it is, has the most um, satisfying of endings, um, assuming they accept that, uh, that charge. But if there is a, um, if there's anyone who doesn't receive that, um, this is a damaging and, 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 and hurtful message. And even the, the concept of, um, of our flesh having to be sacrificed, that hurts. I mean, my, my body, my flesh wants to be here and I'm constantly at war with it. And there's an understanding that, um, that I want to kill my flesh. I mean, graphic terminology about, about sacrificing our own desires and prioritizing God. It's really important that we are aware of this epi epidemic and that we step out in boldness to confront these people, just as Paul is uh, instructing Timothy to do so. All of us have the responsibility uh, the responsibility and the authority to do so uh, through the Bible. And so that's exciting to me. That's exciting to me that we have this responsibility because it means that we are operating in this charge for spreading love. We don't just spread love that is a feel-good message or just a, a, 
um, a watered down truth of what love really is. Uh, but the love of God is something that hurts the flesh, it's damaging to the flesh, and exalts his glory. And that's exactly what we want. We want both of those to, uh, to be evident in tandem. So I'm really excited. Um, that, that's, our, uh, that's it for what we're talking about today. But I'm really excited about our study through 1 Timothy um, because there's a ton of application to um, us in our Christian society today. Um, next week, we um, are going to be having um, Tim Carmichael speak again. He's going to be continuing in chapter one. So I'm very, very excited about that. I hope you guys are as well. Um, we have a rotation of teachers. I'm going to be teaching every other week, um, and then there's going to be a few other guys that are teaching um, off and on as well. So uh, I'm very excited about this. Um, join me as we close in prayer. Lord, I just pray that you would continue to show us your love. Lord, you, you never stop loving us, but I pray that you would reveal what that really means. Lord, that your love for us is not just something that makes us feel good, Lord, but it's something that uh, commands us to have a pure heart and a good conscience before you, Lord, knowing that we are capable of making the right decisions and that uh, with your spirit, we, we are loved and we are commanded to participate in the ministry of Christ. So give us boldness to stand up against the false teachings that are taking place. Give us boldness to not abide that, not to um, tolerate it. And Lord, make us, um, um, make us like good Bereans where we search the scriptures constantly only knowing you through, uh, through the scriptures and what you tell us, Lord. I thank you so much for who you are and what you've given us through um, your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.